Welcome to another Foldit Lab Report. I am BKEP here at the Institute for Protein Design in Seattle with my colleague Ian H. If this is your first time tuning in to Foldit Lab Reports, we produce these videos on the first of every month to tell you more about the science that's happening with Foldit. We have two big stories to share with you in this video. First, we are bringing monkeypox puzzles to Foldit. In this new puzzle series, which is live right now, you can help design molecules which may help treat infections from this concerning virus. We'll get into the details of these new monkeypox puzzles in the puzzle updates section of this video. But first, let's return to the lab and tell you more about what happens to your Foldit designs after a puzzle closes. In our previous two videos, we showed you how a Foldit player solution becomes a piece of custom DNA, and then how we use bacteria and various tools in the lab to turn that DNA into a sample of pure protein. Definitely take a look at those previous videos to get the whole story. See the links in the description. There are all kinds of experiments we can do to study our sample of purified protein. We can probe the sample with polarized light to figure out if the protein is rigidly folded or if it's floppy in solution. We can pass the protein through porous gels to determine its size. We can also mix our protein with other proteins or small molecules to see if they interact. But today we are going to talk about the most exciting experiment of all, solving a protein's structure. This is how we know whether the protein shape you designed and folded is actually achieved in the real world. There are different ways to measure a protein's structure. Sometimes we use an electron microscope. Other times we use powerful magnets. But the experiment that gives us the best, highest resolution picture is X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography is typically one of the last experiments we do because it can be the most difficult and time consuming. If you're wondering why we don't just stick our protein under a normal microscope and look at it, remember that proteins are extremely small. They're so small that we use a special unit of length to talk about them. Not inches or millimeters, but angstroms. One angstrom is equal to 100 millionth of a centimeter. A protein designed by folded players might be only 30 or 40 angstroms across. That's 100 times smaller than the wavelengths of visible light and about a million times smaller than a poppy seed. Because of this, we simply can't use visible light to see proteins the way we see everyday objects or even cells under a microscope. Instead, we'll use a type of light with a much shorter wavelength, X-rays. X-rays have a wavelength that is short enough to resolve the distance between individual atoms in a protein. But before we go blasting our protein sample with a high-powered X-ray beam, we have to pull one more trick we need to crystallize our protein. Why is that? Well, a crystal is a special class of material where all of the molecules inside are aligned in a repeating pattern. Liquid water is not a crystal because the water molecules in it slosh around. But when water freezes into ice, all of the water molecules get locked into a repeating crystal pattern. Not all solid material is an ordered crystal. Glass, for example, is solid, but the silicate molecules inside are all oriented randomly. It's super easy to make water molecules form a crystal. You just lower the temperature. Water molecules have a simple structure, and they easily line up in a predictable way. But protein molecules are anything but simple. Most proteins just don't like to crystallize. And when you figure out how to make one form a crystal, by lowering the temperature or adding some salts, that doesn't tell you anything about how to crystallize another protein. See, proteins only crystallize in very specific conditions, and we don't really understand why. One protein might crystallize only in concentrated ammonium sulfate, and another protein might only crystallize in acid, but maybe only after two weeks. The best way to figure out how to crystallize a new protein is to try as many different conditions as possible and just see what works. This robot is a liquid handler. It helps us set up crystallization experiments so that we can try up to 288 different conditions in a single tray. This robot is fast, but that's not just a convenience. It's actually very important to set up each tray as quickly as possible. If you move slowly, the tiny drops of liquids we're using might evaporate before we seal the tray. Now that our tray is set up, we'll check it under a microscope for crystals. Sometimes a protein crystallizes right away, but if we don't find any crystals, that's okay. We'll let it sit on a shelf and we'll check it again tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, 
It can take months. We set up a lot of crystallization experiments here at the Institute for Protein Design, and that adds up to a lot of time checking trays for crystals. This robot is a crystal hotel, and it helps us monitor trays automatically. It's hooked up to an imager and a computer, which uses image recognition to detect crystals for us. If we're lucky, we'll find tiny protein crystals. Then we can get them ready to be blasted with some x-rays. It's a small crystal, but that's OK. There are still millions of protein molecules packed inside. The first step is to harvest the crystal. Because the crystal is so small, we use a tiny nylon loop that's less than a millimeter across to scoop up the crystal. This requires a steady hand, and we need to be pretty quick. Just like before, we have to watch out for evaporation, which could cause the crystal to disintegrate right before our eyes. Once we have the crystal in the loop, we flash freeze it in liquid nitrogen. This stuff is cold, about negative 200 degrees Celsius cold, or minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. This instantly stops the evaporation process and preserves the structure of the crystal, literally freezing as much of the molecular motion as possible. Now that our crystal is frozen, we're ready to put it under an X-ray beam. This complicated machine can produce X-rays, blast the matter sample, and detect the X-rays on the other side. We place our crystal on something called a goniostat, which positions the crystal directly in the path of the X-ray beam and allows us to rotate the crystal in space. We'll need to spin the crystal a full 180 degrees to make sure we capture X-ray diffraction from all angles. The crystal is kept under a steady stream of cold nitrogen gas so that it doesn't heat up too much under the X-ray beam. As the X-rays shine through the crystal, the beam will diffract off of all of the molecules inside, slightly diverting the path of the X-rays. This forms a unique diffraction pattern that we can see on the detector. If the crystal grew well, meaning no flaws or irregularities, we'll see a sharp diffraction pattern. If the crystal quality is poor, however, we'll see a blurry X-ray photo that won't tell us much about the protein we're trying to study. The key information about our protein molecule is right here in these snapshots. But these diffraction patterns still need a lot of mathematical processing before we can convert them into electron density maps. If you've ever played an electron density puzzle and fold it, you've seen blobs like this before. The blobs are useless on their own until someone can correctly place all of the atoms inside. This is the final and most important step in testing your Foldit solutions. Up until this moment, we've told you that the protein you create in Foldit is just a digital hypothesis. When you design a protein in Foldit, that's not a guarantee that it'll fold up in the real world. But this electron density map tells us definitively the real structure of your protein. We can now see whether it matches the structure that you made in Foldit. As you can see, X-ray crystallography is complicated. It pushes the limit about what's possible to see in nature. These molecules are so incredibly small. The fact that Foldit players have succeeded in designing proteins that really do fold up in the correct shape, as confirmed by X-ray crystallography, is just amazing. I want to give a special shout out to all of our Foldit players for their hard work. And with that, it's time for puzzle updates. As you've probably heard, the monkeypox virus is spreading. In August, we launched the first Foldit puzzles in a new puzzle series for designed monkeypox binders. Compared with coronavirus, monkeypox is a completely different animal, so to speak. Although we've had an effective monkeypox vaccine for decades, scientists don't know nearly as much about the monkeypox virus itself. There are a few reasons for this. One is because we have an effective vaccine. Research on monkeypox hasn't been prioritized in the same way as other dangerous viruses. Another reason is that the monkeypox virus is way more complicated even than the novel coronavirus. Whereas the coronavirus has only two or three proteins on its surface, the monkeypox virus has dozens of different proteins embedded in its surface. We don't know what all these proteins do. We don't know which ones are important for infecting humans, and we don't know which ones we should target with new drugs. The biggest hurdle for us scientists is that we don't have solved structures for any of these monkeypox proteins. To get around this, our monkeypox puzzles rely on a predicted structure of a monkeypox protein named H3. We actually made these predictions with AlphaFold. We don't know everything about how this protein functions, but there is some evidence that it binds to human cells, so it could be important for the virus's infectious activity. If we can design a protein that sticks to the monkeypox H3 protein, we could use it to detect the virus in human blood samples, and maybe even slow infection in infected individuals. Just like with our COVID-19 puzzles, these binder design puzzles are just one step in a long drug development process. 
We wouldn't expect any new drugs to result from this until after human clinical testing, and that can take months or years. And that brings us to the design of the month. We have a strand binder design by Bruno Kestamont and Ikvil Dizanamen. This is from puzzle 2187. Now, this binder design puzzle is different from normal binder design because in this puzzle, we have control over the sequence of the target. We can redesign this target strand to be any sequence that we like. Um, and this will be mostly important for lab experiments where, say, we want to uh, bring two proteins of interest together. We can tether one to our strand here and we can tether the other to our binder. And if we mix those in solution, then we can be certain that the, this binding association will bring our proteins of interest together. Um, important is the fact that our binder should be specific for this strand. Uh, we want to make sure that this binder does not bind to other strands or other sequences that might also be in the solution. So I like to look at all of these in the protein design default. Um, I like to see the, or, uh, the red and blue polar atoms that need to make hydrogen bonds. Um, and let's see, so right off the bat, um, this looks very nice uh, as in all good soluble protein designs, we see a strong core with lots of orange hydrophobic residues that like to be buried from the surrounding solvent. And then on the surface of the protein, we see lots of blue hydrophilic polar residues, which like to make hydrogen bonds. So these would like to be on the outside where they can make hydrogen bonds with the surrounding water. Um, we do, of course, uh, see some exceptions to this. There is a network of hydrogen bonds right in the very center of this protein connecting these blue polar residues. And normally blue polars don't like to be in the core of a protein because they can't make hydrogen bonds. But Ikfil Dizanamen and Bruno have designed a very, very nice hydrogen bond network so that these buried polar atoms actually do make all of the necessary hydrogen bonds. Um, and we see that they have an excellent hydrogen bond network bonus here. Um, a 100% satisfied network, I believe. Um, and um, that will be very, very helpful for specificity um, because it means that if a, another peptide, another strand tried to associate with our binder, um, it would probably not be able to satisfy the hydrogen bonds, um, the polar atoms here on this, this buried histidine. Um, so this means that probably our binder and our target strand will be very selective for one another. And that is very, very important for this kind of puzzle. Um, the other thing I like about this design is that uh, it has lots of hydrophobics on the edge strands. Um, sometimes Foldit will like to put blue polar residues all along these edge strands, even on both sides of this beta strand. Um, and that can cause some problems normally um, if you have a lot of blue polar residues in a sequence without any orange hydrophobics, um, those sequences will tend to be disordered. They won't fold up. Um, but this is nice, especially these two tryptophans here on the end, which contribute to this hydrogen bond network, still present lots of hydrophobic packing, which will help keep this protein folded in a rigid, well-folded form. On top of that, this protein just has really excellent metrics across the board. It's excellent DDG and contact surface. Um, we see only one buns atom has been flagged. Um, this doesn't look too much of a problem to me, this, uh, this, this nitrogen pointing inward from the helix um, can probably be satisfied by water without too much difficulty. Um, so all in all, this looks like a very, very nice strand binder design project, um, designed by uh, Bruno and Ikfil Dizanamen. Um, as a reminder, please share your favorite designs with Foldit scientists. We love to see which solutions Foldit players think are the most noteworthy, regardless of how they rank on the Foldit leaderboards. That's it for this month. As always, thanks for watching, thanks for playing, and we'll see you next time.